Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, I hope everyone had a nice uh, MLK Day. Um, uh, reminding us uh, of the reason for the holiday uh, is important, and I think uh, actually uh, 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 making that uh, making his change actionable in the world is uh, is is perhaps one of the reasons why we have uh, uh, that day of remembrance. Um, I am uh, delighted today to to uh, introduce Cecilia first, Ed, and then Cecilia in a moment. But I just want a few reminders. Um, number one, uh, we have uh, a uh, faculty meeting uh, planned for tomorrow at, at five. Uh, Dr. Desir will be uh, with a guest invite uh, who will be spending uh, 30, 45 minutes of, with, of the time with us talking about a few issues, including uh, faculty compensation. Um, we also have a few uh, 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 candidates coming through in the next few weeks, so please keep uh, uh, your uh, uh, your eyes out for those announcements that come from Liz uh, for the section. And then um, uh, we still have a few uh, changes afoot around the next grand round uh, uh, speaker. Uh, so I'll defer that decision uh, discussion for now. Uh, but uh, before we get Ceci to get started, I'd like Ed to introduce her uh, formally. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cecilia Gallegos, uh, who uh, is obviously, a, what we all know, is a fourth year imaging fellow in the nuclear cardiology lab. And Cecilia, uh, we're lucky to recruit from the um, University of Miami, where she was a resident, chief resident. And what's really been interesting and, and wonderful about what Cecilia has done in the past uh, three and a half years is um, she's taken a really deep academic interest in understanding cardiovascular physiology. And so when we were trying, as well as putting together a uh, a learning program that includes um, participation, that our, our first fellow to, to participate in the Masters of Health Sciences program. So this work that says is going to be presenting today is, uh, is her thesis um, work that, that will lead to uh, her Masters in, the, um, in, um, in May. Um, and what, when, when Cezia and I started, or Cezia started to think about what she wanted to do, we really thought about this what we thought was a fairly simple or straightforward and accomplishable goal, which was to understand regional myocardial uh, blood flow in relation to coronary artery stenosis. It seems like a straightforward topic. But as she's delved into this, we've understood, we've begun to understand the complexity of what she's ask, at, been asking, both from a methodologic perspective and from a physiologic perspective. And so what she's going to present to you today is, is the culmination of that work, some of which is still in progress, but is really, I think, going to fundamentally change and, and enhance our understanding of coronary physiology. So, Cezio, with that introduction, welcome, and we're excited to hear your presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Cezia. I'm one of the nine advanced fellows, one of the four imaging fellows that didn't think was ready to fly just yet and stayed for another year. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure. I really didn't think I was going to make it today, but um, here we are. So I hope you bear with me for this uh, next 45 minutes while I try to catch my breath and get control of my diaphragm and present the results of my thesis. So um, the topic of my presentation is integration of rubidium 82 PET, uh, derived myocardial blood flow quantification, the diagnosis of coronary artery disease. Um, our study was funded by an investigator-initiated grant from BRACO uh, for Dr. Miller. So I would like to start with a patient because really it started um, with a patient in the nuclear lab. So we have a 65-year-old man who presented with, who has a history of coronary artery disease. He had prior PCI to the RCA and LED, um, and he presented to the emergency room, exertional angina, a couple weeks, no chest pain for the past 12 hours, um, yeah, 12 hours. Also history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, history, family history of CAD. So our, kind of one of our typical um, presentations in the emergency room. Um, his initial emergency room eval uh, included three troponin eyes, and then an ECG uh, that shows sinus rhythm without ischemic changes. And as you know, my blue team might or might not have been contacted, but he was admitted to chest pain center to rule out um, an acute coronary syndrome or ristratify, and he was referred for PET myocardial imaging. So this um, is his perfusion imaging, which you're uh, probably familiar with. Um, this is the same information we get from SPECT. <coughs> Here in the top row, by convention, we have stress, and in the bottom we have rest. 
this is the short axis, this is the HLA or horizontal, and this is the vertical. Um, and as you can see, when we go from the base to the apex of the heart, there is a segment that is missing, so that's a perfusion def defect that we called medium, moderate, from basal to apex, infralateral, and inferior wall. So um, now we got these results from the flows, which is the additional information that PET gives us. So when we talk about regional, we're saying per vessel. So we had flows in the LAD, in the CERC, in the RCA, and the global. And you are probably more familiar with the report of the global, which is um, what we have been uh, showing in our Lumetics reports. But if you see uh, into this um, reserve here, into this flows, there's a, a, a big change here in the RCA with a reserve of 0.96. Normal is two. So this is very low. So this is what the receiving end, what the chest pain center gets as a report. Again, we describe the perfusion abnormality as a medium size, moderate intensity, reversible perfusion defect from basal to apex, um, uh, to mid inferior, inferior lateral, and basal inferoceptal walls. We reported the usual global uh, myocardial flow reserve, but we added this. There is severe reduction in coronary flow and flow reserve in the territory of the right coronary artery with a reserve of 0.96. And that is kind of like our idea of um, telling the reading physician there might be something in the RCA. So I just want you guys to hold that thought there and remember these results because it's going to come like very important for the topic of the presentation. So what do we care about what patients present to the emergency room uh, with chest pain or the fact that we have an imaging modality that we can use to risk stratify them? Well, it is very common for patients to present with exertional chest pain to the ED. In fact, in the United States, um, is the second most common cause for uh, uh, presentation in the emergency room, accounting for 7.6 million annual visits. And so um, even though it is the, most, the second most common cause uh, or deadliest cause of presentation to the emergency room, it's only about 25 to 30% that actually have an acute coronary <coughs> syndrome. So it's obviously the responsibility of the provider to figure out, should I activate the cath lab? Um, is this a patient that should get admitted and go directly for cath lab? Or is there a test that I can use so that I can decide whether the patient needs a cath lab or needs medical management. And, and just to, to give you a perspective of what happens here, um, just in 2019, uh, stress test with imaging. This is not including CTA, not including straight ETT, just uh, uh, echo, PET, and SPECT. We had about 4,000 um, studies performed at Yale. As you can see, to about 20% were stress echo, and the majority were in the nuclear, both from the outpatient and inpatient. Though SPECT was a 52% of those uh, tests, you can see that PET, even though it was 28%, had quite a higher a referral for angiography. Um, and that's important because um, we're finding more and more that the additional information given by flow might change how uh, we refer this patient. So why do we care about PET? If you know we have most uh, of our equipment in the community is traditional SPECT. Well, one of the things that we care about is the fact that compared to SPECT, which you saw as the top imaging modality that we refer to, PET offers less radiation exposure, um, and particularly in our women uh, and, the, and uh, obese women, uh, it's very important. Um, it, the, it offers diagnostic accuracy and imaging quality, which is improved the, to, compared to our traditional SPECT imaging. It offers um, the opportunity for a good risk certification prognosis and has a clinical value of providing global and regional myocardial blood flow assessment. So some of the data that, um, just to kind of lay the background on why uh, the comparison between PET and other imaging modalities. So for example, in this one, 2006, the uh, University of Ottawa group was trying, was sought to determine the prognostic value of rubidium 82 PET, um, as well as the quality and diagnostic certainty. And this was compared to traditional SPECT. Not our fancy ZZT cameras that we have here, but mostly you know, the, the cameras that we can find in the community. So in the top table um, here, um, they were looking at the comparison between SPECT and PET in terms of the quality. So they rated the SPECT and the PET from suboptimal 
to good, suboptimal was zero, um, good was uh, two, and that was a, considered a conclusive decision. And as you can see, um, the uh, SPECT had a fair amount of suboptimal uh, readings. And in fact, the PET, their average score was almost close to perfect, to 1.94. When we looked at the diagnostic certainty in this uh, bottom part of the table, we can see from 96 patients that SPECT offered diagnostic uncertainty about 50% of the time. So um, again, the diagnostic certainty with PET was superior compared to SPECT. Um, in this other study from uh, Dr. Bateman, the group in Kansas City, they, again, they wanted to assess the relative image quality, the interpretative uh, confidence and diagnostic accuracy. So they had similar number of matched cohorts controlled for um, CAD, uh, MI, and gender. And so in this top figure um, is the imaging quality scores for PET and SPECT. And as you can see, both the stress and rest the imaging scores for PET were far superior compared to the 62% um, shown here for SPECT. When we do the comparison of degrees of interpretative uh, certainty of SPECT and PECT, in which they um, were trying to uh, grade how many of these studies were conclusive, you can see that SPECT was conclusive only 29% <coughs> of the time compared to the 96% um, of the PET. And these were not influenced by gender or by other uh, risk factors when it was controlled for that. Um, a little bit later, around 2007, the group from the Brigham um, published this paper in the, where they showed the detection of coronary artery disease um, compared uh, in PET, CT uh, versus angiography. And just to mention, when we use uh, PET CT in this case, it was only used for attenuation correction. There was no, you know, kind of cheating to look at is to see if the patient had calcifications or not. Um, and what they found was that uh, coronary that, that PET was able to identify 41 out of the 44 patients that had coronary artery disease by angiography. And in the table three that we have here, this remained true even when they um, looked into the number of deceased vessels by angiography. So it was about 92 and 95 percent, respectively, when they look into one vessel disease or greater than or equal to two. And lastly, um, when we are talking about PET and its uh, ability to help us restratify, and again, this is just purely perfusion. I haven't even um, dived into the additional clinical value of PET flows. Um, this was a multi-center registry that was done in 2013. There were four centers, um, about 7,000 patients, and um, they looked, they had a median follow-up of about 2.2 years. Um, and here we have the hazards of uh, cardiac death and the hazard of all cause mortality. And as you can see, um, the, and, uh, this is the follow-up years and the hazard of cardiac death or uh, all uh, cause mortality. As you can see, every time uh, or by every increase in 10% of myocardium at risk um, as identified by PET, there was a significant increase in mortality. So this study, again, showed um, that PET uh, myocardial imaging really provides powerful and incremental risk estimates. And this has been reproduced one way or another, um, giving us this kind of data. Okay, so now we're going into the fun part, um, the flow uh, quantification. So just one historical slide um, when we're talking about flow. Um, this was actually the first report from 1974 from uh, Dr. Gould um, in, in terms of coronary physiology. This was actually done in dogs. It was the first report uh, on, uh, on this. And what they did is that they injected um, a diat diatrisoate, which increases uh, coronary flow. And so in the top part, we have um, actually the circumflex was injected. Um, the flow increases, there is no obstruction. Um, but it, they noticed that the flow started decreasing until there was about 82% constriction of the vessel, which is what they were doing. Um, and so that really became the basis of our understanding of how coronary blood flow um, uh, is really quantified and works. And so 
when we're, what are we measuring with flow reserve and myocardial flow, blood flow? This is a very famous uh, picture. It's mostly on papers um, trying to compare non-invasive versus invasive um, methods for um, investigating uh, flow. So you can see here, we have the macrocirculation and we have the microcirculation that is comprised by small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. And so when we talk about the invasive procedures, we have FFR looking at macrocirculation, and then we have IMR that we've been doing for a while that looks at the microcirculation. Now, sometimes we tend to change to use MFR interchangeably with FFR, the non-invasive equivalent, but it really isn't um, because the MFR really is not only measuring the epicardial <coughs> arteries, but it's also looking into the uh, microcirculation. So the fact that we are able to assess peak hyperemic, uh, hyperemic myocardial blood flow, um, it it really allows us to identify the entire circulation, and that's an important concept um, to have. Now, when we look at what we're measuring with PET specifically, and you'll see this in a, a few of my slides, um, really what we're looking into blood flow is how um, there's changes uh, when, once we inject the radio tracer when it goes into the blood pool and the myocardial tissue. So this you will see, and I'll show you how our software calculates myocardial blood flow. These are frames or, or time, so it's called a time activity curve, and this is the, time, uh, the, um, the activity of the radio tracer in the left ventricle as well as in the myocardium. So what happens is that um, these time activity curves are derived as the alterations of the radio tracer activity in the y-axis and the arterial blood pool and the myocardium as a function of time in the x-axis. So this is kind of the, our interface when we're looking at myocardial blood flow uh, in PET. So we have here um, just a, a, a picture of how it goes, and I'll show you a video in a, on a few more slides how, um, it, the, how the radio tracer is, is uh, uh, going into the blood pool and the myocardium at stress and at rest, what are the territories, and what information are we getting from the flows, which are, is this portion of the test. So once we... Um, Sorry, that moved. Uh, but once we have uh, this information, you can see here, again, we get the, LA, the regions, the LAD, the CERC, and the RCA. And this information here is what we're calling regional. And when we report it in Lumetics, this is what we see. This is, again, just an example of one of our patients um, in which we only reported the global, which was reduced. Again, we talked about that magic number two. And this is usually <laughs> what you will be seeing in the reports when we're trying to give you that information. So now when we're talking about uh, using flow reserve about prognosis, we talked about in the few slides um, how it has helped risk certification and prognosis when we're talking purely about perfusion. But when we add flow, something interesting happens. So this group um, in 2011 uh, did this study in which they incorporated flow into their progno prognosis. And they created, uh, in about 700 patients, they created four groups. Um, one group had normal perfusion, and that was defined as a some stress score, which is the score that we tend to use to call whether something is normal or not, and I'll, I'll show you in a, a few more slides how that works, um, or if it was abnormal. And then to that, they included a flow reserve normal, so greater than two, or abnormal. And as you can see here, uh, we have here the number of days for follow-up and then the cardiac event-free survival probability. As you can see in the last two, the ones that had um, uh, more events, um, there were patients that even though, for example, this one, even though they did not have any perfusion defects, their mortality was quite higher, showing how, uh, in, how important or how, uh, what additional information flow is really giving us um, in this group of patients. Same with this uh, paper by uh, Dr. Murthy from University of Michigan in 2011. They, they did something pretty cool. They looked at, they re-stratified the patients before they did uh, any type of testing. So they do what we usually do, low, intermediate, or high. 
And then when they added the information given by the CFR, those patients were able to risk uh, to be risk stratified. So, so as you can see, some patients that were actually deemed intermediate ended up being low risk, um, you know, giving a normal perfusion, normal um, uh, as MFR. And some of those that were deemed intermediate ended up being risk, uh, high risk. So um, again, they, they found that a non-invasive quantitative assessment of coronary vasodilation uh, with PET was an independent and powerful um, predictor of cardiac mortality in patients with known or suspected CAD. So with all this uh, background um, on PET and on flows and the uh, physiologic <laughs> basis, um, there was this paper that was published, or the guidelines for quantification of MFR, this was done late 2016, was published early in 2017. Um, uh, and so they, they make the statement that one of the ap practical applications of measuring this uh, myocardial blood flow and flow reserve, uh, it has a potential utility in improving the accuracy with which angiographic CAD is detected uh, and its physiological uh, severity characterized by allowing a more informed decision on referrals for um, cardiac cath. Um, and obviously how to report this, which is really the basis of the talk, uh, requires un understanding what we're talking about when we're uh, reporting uh, blood flow or f uh, flow reserve, as well as the strengths and weaknesses of such physiologic parameters. So this is really, you know, what struck me when we were talking about that patient. And so you remember what I mentioned about the report from the cath at the beginning, right? That, you know, we made that statement, the RCA is, the blood flow is severely reduced. So look at the cath report. Um, it showed that it had a patient had a patent LED stent, but it had a tight ISR of the RCA stent, and it had successful complex PCI of, uh, with DES to the RCA. So then I'm thinking to myself, like, how can we take, tell the remits of the world, you know, based on a non-invasive test? Or Dr. Brennan, who I guess is not here, but he, we've been we've uh, given him examples from our pet as well. How can we tell them, like, go after this vessel with what? Um, certainty, what data do we have to give that information? So actually when we looked into that, we did not have any data uh, regarding that specificity of every vessel, um, how they correlate to um, uh, angiography. So then we wanted to look at what was the clinical utility of our pet uh, and the regional flow that we are obtaining from them using studies uh, performed here. So our aim um, was really to look as regional, not global, global is what we've been, we've been reporting, but regional, every vessel, as a predictor of severity of angiographic stenosis. So we thought, well, <coughs> regional stress myocardial flow or the flow reserve per vessel, in addition to the information we already get from perfusion, might increase the sensitivity in detecting angiographically defined coronary stenosis. So in my thought, the way this was going to work was like, okay, we get a low flow in the LAD, I'm able to tell our uh, uh, interventional colleagues, like, you know, you might want to consider going for, uh, going for this vessel. So our goal was to compare those indices, perfusion, regional flow, and uh, angiography results. So how did we do this? So we got consecutive patients from our lab um, that underwent regadenosin stress only um, and PET that had a coronary angiography, uh, angiography within three months. And this was on the time period of May 2017 to August of 2019. Um, for purposes of the use of uh, QCA or quantitative coronary angiography, uh, we excluded those patients that had cabbage um, or had poor angiographic films. Also because um, the, uh, trying to detect blood flow on those patients was going to be a, a little bit cumbersome. Um, we used our, our G discovery system. And so we obtained two data points from PET, which was relative perfusion per vessel, and also flow and reserve per vessel. Um, and then we used our angiographic films um, in a way that I will show you. So, when we did the quantification of relative myocardial perfusion, uh, we used our 17-segment model. Um, 
used from a camera and tracer specific normal database and the software that we use is the one that I've been showing you it's the, uh, for DM software from NVIDIA. We obtain again regional per vessel and also global resting and regadenosin stress. So this is kind of like where we get the information. So in the top part by convention again we have the stress imaging in the bottom part, we have the rest imaging, and then we have the 17 segment models at stress, at rest, and global. <coughs> and so um, our software is able, again, using the uh, normal database, is able to give us an interpretation of the sum stress score, which we use to kind of say, this is normal or this is severely abnormal. And how do we go about that? The red, as you can see here, is normal. So that is good. Um, and it, it goes and starts changing color to black, which is bad. That means there's severe perfusion defects. So we get a, a score. For example, here it's 41. It's a tiny number here, and this is 12. And as you can see, uh, once we go above 13 or greater, that is a severe perfusion defect. If you go into detail to this, the stress imaging, you can see here that 100% of the LED territory is compromised. But you kind of can see that you know, based on the perfusion defect, it kind of makes sense, right? But it's not so simple as just trying to make sense what perfusion and regional flow is going to show. So then um, we go next with a quantification of blood flow and flow reserve. Um, again, we use it per coronary artery. We use the same software, uh, and we use our kinetic model, um, which is a fixed uh, DV lower T. That I'm not going to go into details about that. So, but this is really the the cool interface that we get. Again, top part is stress, bottom part is rest, and what you're looking at that is not uh, perfusion, really. What we're looking is how the tracer goes into myocardial blood pool in in both segments, and then into um, the myocardial after we choose a region of interest. And so after that, or while that, we're getting um, this time activity curves, similar to that graph that I showed you earlier. Again, this is the activity of the tracer in this segments of the ventricle, and this is the time. Um, the light uh, <coughs> green, or both greens, are the left ventricle, um, and then we have the global and the RV. Uh, but the light green is um, during stress, and this one is during rest. So it's computing this, um, and then it's giving us the flow reserve here, LED circ and RCA, um, and the global, global here. And it also gives us these maps that really is just like the standard way that the software reports um, the different um, territories, for example, the LED the CERC or the RCA, and it gives us what is the fl uh, blood flow in each territory. So once we got that, we were also looking at the angiography of these patients um, using, uh, and this was uh, help from the Yale Core Lab. So what we looked um, uh, were four lesion characteristics mainly. We looked at the obstruction diameter. We looked at the obstruction length. What was the percentage of stenosis based on that in the segment length? <coughs> So this is what QCA looks like. We would get any of uh, the angiographic films. The segment length is identified from the ostium to the far distal, which is usually um, greater than two millimeters, using this automated uh, program. And then we looked at the variables that I mentioned. We looked at the obstruction length, we looked at the obstruction diameter, and the percentage of stenosis. Um, every vessel has their own uh, view. For example, for um, the RCA, or the prefer, uh, preferred view is the LEO, um, for the LED is the uh, REO cranial, and so on and so forth. Um, but we, 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 that's how we got um, the data. So as you can imagine, that's the, the reason why we excluded some of these angiograms, is that really we depend on a good angiographic film to be able to perform this quantification. So far as statistical analysis, once we got our data, we noticed that a lot of the patients had perfusion defects um, on the territories at rest. So to clean up the data, we decided we wanted to do two groups, a greater than or equal to 20 uh, in terms of uh, the perfusion uh, defect, or a less than 20. And then we performed three things. 
we did a logistic regression um, to define the odds to have a significant coronary artery lesion defined as greater than 50% using uh, the regional myocardial flow indices. And I will go into the reason why we got the 50% was our threshold. Um, and then we did Spearman correlation to look at the association of per vessel degree of stenosis and flow reserve. And lastly, based on the results of the Spearman correlation, we decided to graphically illustrate the association between flow reserve and percentage of stenosis using a cubic spline function. So these were our results. In the period from May 2017 to, uh, um, to August 2019, we had 304 interpretable pets. Um, so we had many more pets, but some of them, the flow reserve was not uh, either, had, there was technical issues with it, so we couldn't include them for interpretation. <coughs> We excluded, again, those patients that had cabbage just because we weren't going to be able to uh, quantify flow or do the QCA. We only included regadenosin, so we excluded any other type of, of um, stressors. And then those patients that really didn't have a nice angiographic film that we could work with were also excluded. So a total from the 304, uh, we had 190 patients um, to evaluate. From those, again, Per vessel, we separated them, and then those that had resting perfusion defect uh, greater than 20 went to one group, and those that had resting perfusion defect less than 20 went to another group. And we looked into the same characteristics. Um, I think it's worth mentioning they were not uh, necessarily matched, um, but it was just more to try to get the cleanest data that we could. This is, um, these are the baseline characteristics of the group as a whole without um, separating them. And so you can see here that we have a good mix of uh, female and male patients. And when you see the risk factors, you can see they're all intermediate to high risk. The BMI was on average at 34. 47% of the patients were diabetic. 78% um, um, were also hypertensive. 67% had hyperlipidemia, and 25% of these patients already had a prior MI, which was very important to us to look into. And as you can see here, um, you know, these risk <coughs> factors are also risk factors for other entities, such as microvascular disease, which was very important for us um, to identify in this cohort of patients. So again, we divided them in, based on the absence or presence of perfusion defects, greater than or equal to 20, or less than or equal to 20. And then we had the baseline characteristics uh, per vessel. I'm obviously not going to go into this uh, details uh, slide, and, and I just wanted to make the point that uh, we had looked into making sure that the groups were um, kind of similar. Okay, so we go to the, uh, the basis of our, of, of our results. So as you can see here, these three graphs, um, show the distribution of myocardial flow reserve, or MFR, per vessel and global. So we have here per vessel the LAD, the RCA, and the CERC, and this is the global. And as you can see, the median is around 1.74 to 1.77, which is, again, lower than the usual two that we use. And so if you were already wondering why we were using 50% as our cutoff, even though we had a huge sample of patient compared to any other study uh, published in this topic. Um, as you can see, if we moved our threshold to, for example, greater than 70%, we were going to have very few patients. So we left it um, at 50 per every uh, vessel here. Okay, so now the interesting part comes. So once we do the logistic regression and we're trying to understand what is the association between per vessel um, flow reserve, uh, blood flow, um, then this is what we get. This was only in the LAD. So you see how the LAD flow reserve in this case is actually predictive of angiographic stenosis greater than 50%. So it makes sense, right? An odds ratio of 0.36 <coughs> means that for every unit increase of LAD flow reserve, there's a 64% reduction of, or, of prediction of for angiographic stenosis greater than 50 which makes sense if you think about it, right? The higher the stenosis, the lower um, the flow, uh, the stress blood flow and the flow reserve. And same was the result for the stress blood flow. 
it was statistically significant with an odds ratio of 0.45. I don't think we were greatly surprised by, by those results, but it makes sense. You know, once, again, physiologically, once the, um, we get a greater stenosis, the flow is going to be reduced. When we look at the RCA stress blood flow, which we also thought was predictive, at least when we looked at the stress uh, portion, again, it was statistical significant, and the stress blood flow had an odds ratio of 0.96 with a uh, confidence interval between 0.15 and 0.57. Um, when we looked at the reserve, as you remember, in the LAD was statistical significant. Um, this had a tendency, but uh, probably was under power because remember, we looked into every vessel, so there's a chance we had less, or we indeed had less RCA um, obstruction compared to LED. But again, it shows um, that for every change in the unit of stress blood flow, um, there is a decreased chance of having an obstruction. Now, something interesting happens when we look at the uh, circumflex. Um, there really is no association, so we're starting to think uh, why, why uh, this is the case. And one of the things is, um, which I'll mention when we go about the limitations, is we didn't really go into proximal, mid, or distal obstruction when we looked into this analysis. Um, and we're looking at it now, but not in the, in the results that we included today. And the other thing is um, the importance of understanding that perhaps vessels such as the CERC um, have a downstream, uh, have a, are affected downstream by obstruction in other vessels saying, you know, uh, we didn't separate them really. Uh, like if there was an obstruction in the CERC or, uh, or in the LAD, maybe the fact that the LED was obstructed is um, altering uh, the flows in the CERC, making it a less reliable value uh, in terms of the flow reserve or stress blood flow. So when we plot um, our, our uh, QCA and flow reserve per every vessel, we had 189 LED uh, vessels that were interrogated by QCA. Uh, when we look at the variable that we looked uh, uh, at the that we measured, sorry, with the QCA, you see that there is a very weak correlation between regional flow and obstruction characteristics here. For example, the obstruction diameter had a p-value that's 0.01, but the R was 0.18. Um, same when we looked at the percentage of stenosis. But so when we look at the graphs. Um, in the left side, you have the LED flow reserve plotted against the obstruction diameter. And the uh, right side, we have the flow reserve uh, plotted against a percentage of stenosis. The, really, the values are kind of all over the place. Almost if you look here, for example, for percentage of stenosis, when we start going less than two, which is what we consider, um, start considering abnormal, we have a group of patients that had no stenosis, or they were graded as 20 to 40 percent uh, stenosis by QCA, and bringing um, again the topic of how many of these patients were actually microvascular disease that showed that there was uh, uh, abnormality in the in, in the blood flow. So to try to understand a little bit more, and again I just show the LAD because the RCA and the CERC were very different, uh, very similar results. Um, so we try to do a cubic spline function to try to um, show the confidence interval and the possible prediction. So we have the myocardial flow reserve here and the risk of having a significant lesion in this graph. And to your right, we have the myocardial flow reserve and the percentage of stenosis. So maybe we can focus more on this graph. Um, the light pink has a 95% uh, confidence interval. And then the darker pink is um, that prediction. So as you can see, something interesting happens. We tend, and the guidelines that I show you say less than two is abnormal. But we really start seeing how the curve um, deflects at around 1.5, 1.6, just <coughs> visually. And so we can see here that once it starts going down, really, again, that we see that amount of patients that will have a percentage of stenosis of 40 and 20% that really, you know, are, that, that is not something that we would uh, treat invasively. That's more of medical management. So we kind of fall and look that we have a substantial percentage of patients that have microvascular disease compared to obstructive CAD um, as we have defined it in, in the modern area. 
So then we did a um, ROC curve again of the LED to see what would be the index or the number at it, an MFR will predict a significant lesion. So we got again 1.6, meaning at 1.6 the, the chances of having an obstructive, a significant lesion or of the LED MFR to predict a significant <coughs> lesion is high. So with that information, um, with all that basis, we went and looked, okay, how does the sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value change once the MFR drops to less than 1.5? And as you can see, it has a great negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value um, is poor. So, um, so conclusions and limitations from this study. Um, one of the great things from uh, what we did here is that it was the first large study to show relationship, uh, relationship between uh, per vessel blood flow and flow reserve and coronary stenosis measured by QCA. Um, what we found is that regional flow may predict significant stenosis, particularly at the site of the LED and RCA, but perhaps not with the CERC. And this might be, um, uh, might be affected by downstream flow in other vessels, making the measurement more reliable. Um, I, another one of our conclusions is that at MFR values less than or equal to 1.5, rubidium 82 PET has a specificity of 65% um, and a negative predictive value of about 89% to predict greater than 50 stenosis across all vessels. So um, <coughs> given our, the data on functional assessment from stenosis, our definition of obstructive angiographic lesions needs further exploration and obviously we know that there's um, uh, RCTs looking into this. So what were some of the limitations that uh, we're working on uh, about this study? One thing that's very important um, is the fact that blood flow and flow reserve is very sensitive to changes or, uh, in hemodynamics. So we did not, the data that we presented today was not corrected for rate pressure product or the blood pressure and heart rate. Um, so they're not included in this analysis, but we are analyzing them separately. <coughs> Again, what I mentioned, we don't know how much the fact that we did not use proximal, mid, or distal when we uh, stenosis. When we looked into the changes in the flow reserve, may or uh, impact our analysis. So we're also looking into that. The other thing is QCA is operator dependent. Um, there may be variability in the lesion characteristic quantifications. Again, we depend on good angiographic films, but maybe when I am tracing the segment. Um, I get one value, then maybe someone else comes in and, and uh, changes that uh, obstruction. So that might be um, uh, a limitation. And then I think probably the bigger topic here is that in our population, we notice that there is perhaps um, it's a, a microvascular disease is really a major contributor of decreased regional flow. And we could see in those graphs how even though the flow started to decrease, there was a, a, a proportion of patients that really had no clinically important uh, obstructive disease. And those are the patients that we will uh, be needing to, to target. So some of the closing remarks and future directions. Um, in, you know, I, I was thinking, I was like, okay, do I still need more data um, to really help direct our interventional colleagues into what will be a management of uh, angiographic stenosis? I think we, there's obviously more work to do, but when we try to incorporate um, data like calcification, perfusion, and flow, we will probably be able to give more information um, in, in terms of revascularization. But definitely there are <laughs> gaps in our current knowledge, uh, particularly in patient phenotypes, and also mechanistic understanding and diagnostic modalities of those patients that have some degree of coronary artery disease, obstructive or non-obstructive, but in addition, uh, they have microvascular disease. And so, 
then again, this poses the question how uh, challenging the diagnostic evaluation of non-obstructive CAD is. I did use uh, an example of a patient that had clear obstructive coronary disease and had history <laughs> of coronary disease, but how many of these patients with microvascular disease present the same way with the same risk factors to the emergency room and end up having kind of like the similar um, um, uh, testing with PET and then angiography because we can't really find what's, uh, uh, what, what is the issue there. And so further <coughs> research focusing on protocols and diagnostic modalities to identify and treat microvascular disease are obviously paramount important. And we hope that we can take this data that we have and try to analyze it in a way that we can also help identify those, uh, those patients. So with this, um, I wanted to thank you all for coming. I have um, some acknowledgments. I really want to thank my thesis committee. Um, Dr. Miller was my primary mentor. Um, <laughs> Dr. Sinousas, who apparently <laughs> I, 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 I may be able to graduate in May, as well as Dr. Liu and Dr. Spaz. Dr. Spaz, I didn't find your emoji, so I couldn't put it there. Um, and um, Dr. Miller has been my, my primary clinical and research mentor, and I'm, I'm really grateful. As you know, I'm from Honduras, and the opportunity of being here um, has been great. It has been fantastic for years. Um, I will always thank him because the opportunity of being in this fellowship makes me the first adult uh, female cardiologist in Honduras, so I'm very proud of that. Um, and my research team, Dr. Uh, Iwa, who I, I torture with the data, and my um, uh, research uh, fellows, Kami, and, uh, who is from Colombia, and she's doing her residency in Yukon, and Lily, who was a Mexican fellow doing one year of her PhD here and was fantastic. Um, so it speaks a lot of uh, our diversity in our group. I want to thank the Yale Nuclear Lab as well, the techs and the nurses and everyone who have always been fantastic, um, the core lab, uh, and um, special thanks to Brian Young and um, Stephanie Thorne, as well as my co-fellows, who are we're finally moving up uh, the ladder, at least most of us. Um, <laughs> and then last but not least, uh, my mother, who is really the reason why I even made it to the United States. Her support and, and her love has been great. And my husband, who's somewhere in the audience with my hospital bag, just in case. Um, <laughs> but he's been supportive, and uh, he's been to literally every conference uh, with me, and, and it, has, uh, it has been fantastic. So thank you very much. I'm open for any questions. Yeah, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk and a great beginning. You have uh, a lot of work to do. <coughs> Correct. A uh, couple of comments and one question. Uh, first, if you go back in the old literature on looking at specific coronary distributions and visual imaging, you find the same issue with the circumference. Correct. So this is common and is probably a technical issue. Uh, second, as, as one looks at the limitations, one of the things that strikes me as we get narrower in terms of our ability to dissect this out is that we have uniform distributions on the perfusion imaging Correct. Uh, for each of the coronary arteries, whereas we know there is marked variation in the size and the distribution of those vessels. So unless we really correct for that, we're never going to be able to have as accurate a set of data. And that's got to be obviously retrospective mm -hmm. once you have the coronary anatomy. But there needs to be adjustments based upon variation in normal coronary anatomy. And third, the, the future of the field as it's been thought about for the past 15 to 20 years with PET is not so much in single vessel disease where there's one big lesion and maybe some little stuff but where you have three vessel disease. And I think one of the things, uh, have you looked at the database that you have in terms of multi-vessel disease and see how your ability to <coughs> define multi from single vessel disease uh, where you have just 
one vessel or one large vessel and other significant but not as significant as the obstruction. So um, two comments. So um, we agree with the profusion part and the flow of the, the territories. One of our ideas, which is not wasn't really uh, your question, but one of our ideas is to try to juxtapose uh, the CT for coronary for attenuation and the presence or absence of calcification, juxtapose it to kind of like what territories are being marked by the software as being LED, RCA, and CERC. But we haven't been able to, you know, to, to get to that. Um, and for your second, or for your question, really, we, we are looking into that. We're doing two things in the future. One is actually looking at those patients that have only one vessel, uh, because here we have, like, you know, we separated per vessel, but really we included patients that had one vessel disease up to three vessel disease, right? So uh, one of our ideas is to separate only and analyze those patients that have only one territory being affected, just to analyze them separately versus those patients with two or, or three. Uh, because it's definitely it's probably going to change, and we, I guess we'd, it would be interesting to see what the flow reserve per region do when the, those three or the three are affected. That was a great presentation. So, and, and I agree with you that the importance of microvascular disease is one of the problems with the discordance. But also, you know, back in the 90s, actually when Joe Wu did his medical thesis in my lab, you know, he did, uh, in an acute animal experiment, created graded occlusion of the LAD. And graded occlusion of the LAD in increased flow, impaired flow reserve in the LAD, but also progressively impaired flow reserve in the remote territories. And obviously, those animals didn't have microvascular disease, so there's a mechanical effect. So I think what you said is important, that singling out single arteries <coughs> is going to be important because disease in one vessel can affect flow reserve in another vessel. So, so, but I think you have the data to kind of tease that out. That was great, but one question. How, how did you handle people who had multiple lesions in a given vessel? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's one thing that we're looking. So because we have to go back and look at the QCAs um, and how the, uh, the interventionalist reported those lesions as well and analyze them separately. Because in this an analysis, and again, that was a limitation, is we just went with whole vessel. We didn't go into like proximal, uh, mid or distal, or even multiple uh, lesions. Now, the issue with the QCA, though, is that the QCA really picks which lesion they consider significant, and that's the information that it gives us. So again, using the software, you know, becomes a little bit of a, uh, a limitation on its own. It's just probably easier than if we do it subjectively just by our, looking ourselves to the cat data. But we'll have to integrate both because I think that's an important, you know, uh, question that we need to answer. Yes. So <clears throat> wonderful work, exciting talk, especially with the excitement that you might have to run out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. I was just joking. <laughs> um, so, I, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by the potentially negative um, prognostic information about microvascular abnormalities. And so there's microvascular abnormalities. There are <coughs> abnormalities at the level of the arterioles and those at the level of the capillaries. And at the level of the arterioles, that could be either a smooth muscle cell defect or an endothelial defect. At the capillary level, it's got to be presumably, uh, I mean, there are other cells that could be involved, but it's probably an endothelial defect. And as an endothelial-centric guy, I always think that that is the most profound abnormality at the microvascular the vessel level because that's potentially everywhere, including in large vessels. Are there, are there any approaches that you can use that would segregate and give us information about microvessel at one level versus microvessel? I, I know it's a little off topic, but capillary specific versus arteriolar specific. Um, well, with doctors' pads, we're trying to actually look into those phenotypes and really try to segregate those patients. But I think at the non-invasive level, just because the PET is both epicardial and, um, 
and microvascular, probably not. We've been using, and some of those patients actually include some patients that we did with Dr. Pao and Samit that have both PET and have a regional uh, flow quantification, and in addition to that, have IMR. So then we knew for sure whether patient, you know, whatever the PET reported was really microvasculature or it was, you know, just a, a consequence of epicardial disease. So, so far, that's kind of how, we, um, how we've been doing, but we don't have all 304 pets that went to angiography uh, underwent IMR. Um, that, that's something that we had been having in the back of our mind, how to create a protocol that, you know, all these patients end up getting IMR uh, regardless, you know, if they have the regional flow. That would be, I think, one of the, the ways to do it uh, at the current time. Um, excellent. <laughs> Could you uh, comment on patients who have chronic total effusions with and without collateral fill of the distal vessel? So, so what, did, what did you find? In those yeah, patients? so we actually excluded those because it, we are unable to um, do the QCA, and really the focus on this analysis was trying to gauge the angiographic. Um, you know, definitions for those characteristics. So we did not look into those uh, details, unfortunately. I would just say also I commend you because this is such open space and um, there's so much work to do here. When you look in the literature, there's imaging data and then there's um, dynamic interventional data, but rarely are the two really coordinated. And there's so much phenotyping that needs to, ex that could exist. To first to distinguish epicardial versus non-epicardial, and then as you're saying, endothelial versus non-endothelial dependent um, dyna dynamicity of the actual vessels. So this is really just kind of the start, and it's been really eye-opening to kind of understand where we break down in terms of even identifying um, uh, obstructive disease using flow reserve. And then I think the next step is to kind of dig deeper to integrate the different modalities which is sort of the next challenge going forward. Anyone else agree? I mean, there are there are folks at Yale who are doing true capillary-based mm -hmm. microvessel uh, physiologic studies at the skin, uh, peripheral skin level. Mm -hmm. um, and I can connect you with, with them if that would be helpful, because that could potentially get at the difference between a true capillary endothelial defect and an arteriolar larger vessel defect, which eventually might have a course of No, no, definitely. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Wonderful work. I know you've done some studies and learned tremendous about it physiologically and about the current The question really comes to you as you start preparing this work in the next phases of this work is the challenge with this type of work is always verification bias. Correct. And so, um, you made a conclusion around microvascular disease, but it may be related to the types of patients that are actually referred mm -hmm. to which are the So I guess um, one of uh, just a recommendation to clearly define uh, the demographic differences between those who were referred for this type of test versus all the others that you showed uh, to get other tests. And second, to get your perspective after all these years in the lab and in this last past few years, of what are the types of patients that this faculty and others around are referring for this particular test. Is it focused on what uh, uh, Dr. Zarin said, which is trying to find and differentiate the multi-vessel person versus a single person person versus uh, or, or those people who are we're really looking to find in the myocardial uh, or microvessel uh, or microvascular dysfunction? I think um, it's, it's a mix. I would say maybe at the beginning, um, the first couple of years, um, I think we were probably looking for a better test to say is like, but particularly when we have uh, patients that had testing in the community with our traditional spec cameras, with maybe some you know defects that we're thinking is like, or is this an artifact? Or is it really a patient with you know multi-vessel disease or single-vessel disease? But more and more, as our understanding of the entity of microvascular disease has become, uh, or everyone has become aware, even, you know, our internal uh, medicine colleagues, we're seeing a lot, and particularly women. Uh, uh, women with risk factors and with um, some symptoms, and actually, I think two years ago, we presented on that, because we were, th that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, also, uh, patients with obesity, diabetes, that we're looking is, is this really angina just from epicardial disease or is this something else? Yeah, exactly. 
So I'd like to congratulate Cecilia on the